Yeah, I, I uh, tweaked the title a little bit. Uh, yeah, so uh, the Adobe type team has always been about trying to invent the future. And of course, the future isn't always what you expect. It keeps things interesting. I've been very fortunate to be at Adobe for most of the time that Adobe's been around. And I'd like to share some thoughts with you about the changes we've been through. I'll start with saying a few words in particular about Kaizen, uh, the word you saw on my first slide. Kaizen's a wonderful blend of East and West, uh, Confucian f philosophy and American business practice. It's about getting everybody on the team to look for ways to make things better, faster, and more reliable. Lots of changes, often small, uh, help quality emerge. Kaizen is what brought Japan out of the destruction that resulted from World War II. Those of us who are old enough to remember when made in Japan was a badge of shame, it made it cheap and unreliable. Now, because of 60 years of Kaizen, Japan makes some of the best quality products around. Similarly, Adobe's fonts have never been perfect. But by constantly improving them, we've made something pretty good. I'm here to talk about those improvements. Adobe quickly developed a reputation for quality fonts. What many people don't realize is that this isn't because we were all that good when we started. We were simply better than the alternatives. And that's not saying much. <laughs> When Adobe shipped its first fonts in the 85, the only alternatives for desktop publishing were bitmap fonts. If you used them at actual size on screen, they looked okay, but if you scaled them or printed them, they looked like a pile of bricks. Adobe provided bitmap fonts too, but they were just for laying out on the screen. They were linked to outline fonts that could be printed on a PostScript printer at 300 DPI. Or if you spent the big bucks, 1,260 DPI on a PostScript image setter. Higher resolutions came along soon. If you stop and think for a minute, you'll realize there was no software for editing PostScript outlines back in 1984 when we started. Adobe had to create its own. It didn't happen very quickly. Also, there were serious size problems. Early PostScript printers had very little room for fonts, and the connection for downloading print jobs to a printer was really slow. Making the file bigger by adding fonts slowed it down more, so Adobe needed to make the font files as small as possible. One of the first families in the early PostScript printers was Courier. A really talented engineer named Linda Gass, who now makes beautiful quilts, uh, programmed Courier in a text editor. The original Adobe Courier was a set of PostScript paths that were stroked to create a visible glyph. Stroke a few pixels wide made the regular weight, and a heavier stroke made the bold, and the outlines were sloped to make obliques to fill in for italics. This allowed one minimal set of PostScript data to behave like four fonts. Saved a lot of space. Of course, it didn't look so great. <laughs> The other main families in the first PostScript printers were Helvetica and Times. Uh, rumor has it they were digitized by John Warnock's sons. I believe the engineers tried to program these in a text editor too and concluded that they really had to create a tool for editing outlines. The new tool was still pretty crude when these families were produced and of course there wasn't anybody who had any experience with PostScript outlines. The end result actually looked pretty decent at normal sizes, but it got pretty lumpy when set really large. Here are the original glyphs from Times and Helvetica compared to more recent versions. You can see the difference mainly in the Times serifs, and the Helvetica curves are really wonky. Many things happened in the next few years. First, Adobe hired Sumner Stone, somebody with real type design experience, who hired other typographically talented people. And of course, 
Adobe kept improving our editing tools until we finally switched over to an off-the-shelf editor in the mid-90s. Finally, in 1989, Linotype officially complained to us that our funky representation was damaging their trademark. <laughs> so we got new data from them and completely overhauled these families. Hinting was at the heart of PostScript's success. No previous approach was able to make decent bitmaps on 300 DPI devices on the fly. The first release of PostScript had a very simple model for hints. There was one baseline and five top alignment zones, the blue values array. And there was one set of hints for each glyphs, and hints could not overlap. Even before the post, first PostScript printer shipped, it was clear that more hinting information was necessary to get decent results. By the time the LaserWriter Plus shipped in 1986, Adobe had added more bottom alignment zones, the other blues array, and a mechanism to handle overlapping hints. Hints still can't actually overlap, but things that would overlap can be stored in separate layers. Each layer is loaded when the portion of the outline it controls is being drawn in the rasterizer. Revising Times in Helvetica wasn't the only big change we made in 1989. Apple and Microsoft lit a fire under Adobe by announcing they were going to ship an alternate format called TrueType. Perhaps the biggest advantage of TrueType, at least from our point of view, was that the OS would rasterize type right on screen so people could see the actual type they were working with instead of using bitmap approximations. Adobe was determined to get there first with live type, and we did. We shipped ATM, uh, the Adobe Type Manager, nine months before TrueType actually shipped. ATM let people use PostScript fonts they already had. That type had been built to look good at 300 DPI and up. Mac screens were only 72 DPI, a quarter of the resolution we'd been proofing at. The lower resolution put a lot of pressure on hints. We ended up rehinting most of the fonts in the library, our first library-wide revision. We also, well, actually, that was our second library-wide revision. Uh, we also discovered that we needed to keep as many of an outline's hints as possible in each layer so the rasterizer could be aware of the other hints while making its adjustments. ATM also introduced a higher quality rasterization model for better results at low resolutions. We still use the old model at larger resolutions where it's faster and a half pixel difference is less critical. And at really high resolutions, we simply use PostScript's graphics rasterizer. This can make debugging a rasterization problem kind of interesting. Moving to ATM forced Adobe to redo a few fonts that used non-standard approaches. We finally retired the stroked Courier in 1990, making it a normal outline font that would work fine in ATM. We also had a couple font families that used two sets of outlines, one for image setters with their high resolution and one for laser printers with lower resolutions. The fonts included code to detect the printer's resolution and apply the correct set of outlines. ATM's better rasterization let us switch to using the high-res outline everywhere. These are outlines of high and low-res glyphs from the two families, Optima and ITC Eris. I offset the low-res Optima I so you can see the difference better. Following the release of ATM, Adobe made good on its promise to publish the Type 1 font format specification. I learned there's a big difference between an unofficial spec and a, an official one. Getting the details nailed down and cleaned up took nearly a year. But not only did this help promote the format, it made us clean up our own technical act. Adobe knew early on we need to be able to handle more than just Latin fonts. We needed to stop, we started working with Morisawa to get their fonts working with PostScript printers. PostScript was set up to work with one byte encodings. 
So type 1 fonts couldn't use more than 255 glyphs. Of course, Japanese needs tens of thousands. Adobe engineers crafted a sort of virtual font mechanism that enabled hundreds of type 1 fonts to function as a single Japanese font. It was a massive kludge, but it got PostScript accepted by the Japanese printer manufacturers. A few years later, we created the much more flexible CID font format that we still use today for East Asian fonts. In time, we also built up our own type development team in Tokyo. We understand things better when we do them ourselves. So this lets us stay on top of the technical issues as well as creating cool original designs. Of course, we had a problem with 255 glyph fonts on the Western side too. Many fonts really need a healthy set of ligatures, small caps, old style figures, and other alternates in order to enable decent typography. There wasn't nearly enough room for them in a one byte font. We defined a set of glyphs beyond the standard fonts and set them up in supplemental fonts we called expert sets. We learned a few things. <coughs> Only serious typographers were willing to buy the expert sets. Most people really didn't care. Expert sets were hard to use. You had to switch fonts to get the glyphs, which had the extra drawback of making it impossible to kern between them and the main fonts. And because type 1 fonts weren't using Unicode, the expert characters used the values of normal characters, often completely unrelated. This screwed up the text stored in a document. This is one of several reasons we started looking into defining a next generation font format. John Warnock figured out how to do on-the-fly rasterization in PostScript, so we were all thinking about other ways to use computer technology to do new things with fonts. I think one of the coolest things Adobe ever did was on-the-fly interpolation in what we called multiple masters. We put compatible designs at two ends of a continuum, or four corners of a square, or eight corners of a cube, or 16 corners of a hypercube, and let the user pick any point in between to get exactly the interpolation they wanted. Inside Adobe, there were people who saw three very different uses for this technology. John Warnock saw that we could use it to approximate fonts that might be missing in a document. We still have special purpose multiple master fonts in Acrobat that do this today. Other people saw the ability to adjust weight and width, either dramatically or as subtle adjustments for things like copy fitting. And some of us were most excited about enabling designs optimized for the specific size being used, a capability that the metal punch cutters always had but got lost along the way with phototype. We figured out how to modulate the adjustment, most of which happens in the smaller sizes, to get optically adjusted designs for virtually any size. As an example of the kinds of design adjustments made for different sizes, here's a recreation of four A's cut by Claude Garamont, scaled to the same point size. We could interpolate between these. But the cool technology was pretty hard to support. Every time we added a feature like transitional designs or intermediate masters, we had to do a bunch of engineering work in ATM to support it. We also faced a classic chicken and egg problem. Very few people actually used the interpolation features because they weren't supported in the main applications. The main applications weren't interested in adding support for the interpolation features because very few people used them. No. <laughs> we tried to learn a lesson from this when it came time to promote OpenType. The Type 1 format was a version 1.0 kind of effort. Lots of good ideas, but a number of things not considered. Adobe was working on Acrobat in 1991, and along with a way to emulate missing fonts, we needed a way to embed fonts in PDF. Of course, we needed to keep the files small even if lots of fonts were embedded. A couple of our best engineers sat down and wrote a 2.0 version of the format. We called it the compact font format. 
embodied everything we learned in the first 10 years of type 1 and managed to reduce the font file sizes by nearly half. When we signed the open type agreement with Microsoft, it was clear that CFF was the format to use for PostScript open type fonts. Shortly after we shipped our first open type fonts, we also published a public specification. We haven't made any type 1 fonts since 1998. There are a lot of advantages to open type, but CFF is definitely one of them from my point of view. Like CFF, OpenType was a second generation effort. We've been thinking about what was needed for 21st century fonts, and it turned out Microsoft was thinking similar thoughts. We combined Apple's SF&T structure with Unicode support to make a much more extensible format than the original Type 1 or TrueType. And of course, it had the convenience of a single cross-platform file. The other key component was layout intelligence. The OpenType model lets the font supply information about the glyphs that the application can use to do better typography by default. This is cool stuff for Western typography, but it's essential for many non-Western systems. Here again, we were learning from earlier mistakes. We saw how our earlier efforts with multiple masters never really went mainstream, not well supported in apps, and thus hard to use. We also saw how Apple's GX line layout technology, which tackled a problem similar to OpenType, was rejected by all the main applications because it took over most of their choices about layout. We were determined to not repeat the same mistakes, and thankfully, we now live in an OpenType world. Even so, we've seen lots of room for improvement. Some of the features we originally defined have been, since been deprecated. Plenty of others have been clarified and reworked, and still others are even now being added by interested parties chiming in. This is Kaizen at its best. When Adobe started, the computer screen was a crude preview device and nothing more. We had had tuned bitmap, bitmap fonts that emulated a handful of sizes, and other sizes were scaled bitmaps, which looked awful. ATM was the first time the fonts were really imaged on screen. As I mentioned earlier, we discovered we had to do hinting quite differently for that kind of use. Version 2 of ATM introduced simple grayscale anti-aliasing, which was a new concept to most people at the time. We explained it as font smoothing. This effectively increased the resolution, reversing some of the impact of low-res screens. Later, LCD screens began to replace the CRTs that had been standard for so many decades. The LCD structure with red, green, and blue elements in each pixel opened the door to even higher resolution anti-aliasing. Both Microsoft and Adobe took that step, but independently. Best practices for font tables are moving target and standards evolve. We do the best we can in QE, but we definitely still find bugs after fonts have shipped. Then, there always seems to be another currency character coming. The Euro, the Ukrainian hryvnia, the Turkish Lira, the Indian Rupee, the Russian Ruble. Uh, something that's required in at least some of the fonts. And there are the general design improvements I talked about earlier. So any font that's been in the Adobe Type Library more than a year or two has been revised at least once, many multiple times. This is Kaizen in practice. But the revisions create a new problem. People don't think of fonts as software that gets updated. Unless it actually comes with other software, like their OS, they get a font and use it for decades. They don't get fixes and enhancements. For a small foundry, that has a close relationship with each of its customers, that'd be no big deal, but lots of people using our fonts don't even remember where they got them. <clears throat> Web font services have pointed the way to a new answer. We're now at a point where it's practical to treat fonts as a service. This doesn't just enable everyone to have the latest and greatest version. It introduces an entirely different business model that has the potential to get far more people using far more fonts which I think will ultimately be good for everybody.
This is something I've been looking forward to for at least 20 years. So I'm excited to see the first steps finally coming together. Thank you. Thank you.